Welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast, Episode 12. You are listening to the Cash Car Convert Podcast with James Kinson. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cash Car Convert Podcast. My name is James Kinson and I am the Cash Car Convert. This is the podcast where cash cars are cool and auto debt is dangerous to your financial future. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of uh, trading in a car. Now I have to start by saying I've never traded in a car. I've uh, thought about it and even tried on occasion. Each time I've tried, uh, the price offered to me was not sufficient to uh, get me to make the move. Every time I felt like I was leaving too much money on the table and having sold cars myself my whole life, I know that I can sell a car. And having done some research, I also typically know what they're worth So, um, from a private seller's perspective. And so I'm able to sell them and, uh, and make much more money than I ever would on a trade-in. Now, Kelly Blue Book says that when you trade your car in versus selling it yourself, you lose about 15 to 20 percent of uh, what you could make. Just to put those numbers in perspective, uh, if you're talking about a $20,000 car, that means you're giving up between three and $5,000. On a $10,000 car, that means you're giving up between $1,500 and $2,500. You like the way I kept the math simple there? Well, that's the way I like to do things. Keep it simple. But not so simple that I'm willing to give up a lot of money because, uh, you know, if I was really all about simple all the time, I would just trade my car in. Now, even though I've never worked in the uh, auto industry, I do want to try and give uh, the dealer's perspective here from as fair a point of view as I can. And I think that um, the, the first thing I would say about that is, is um, a dealer's in the business to make money. I mean, that's what they're there for. They are a business. They, they intend to turn a profit. And, uh, you know, I've got no issue with that. I'm glad they're there. Um, they do a lot of work for uh, people. Uh, they give you a, you know, a single consolidated place to go look at a vehicle. And um, so there's a lot of benefit there. Also, when you bring your car in, they don't know you. They don't know your car. Um, you know, I am absolutely certain that they have made uh, mistakes in the past in judgment on cars, and uh, they've cost themselves some money. So as as accurate as they're trying to be with their uh, guesstimate of a value uh, for this quick trade-in number, uh, they don't know your car. They don't know all the things about it that you do. They don't know how well you've maintained it or not. So, uh, so they're obviously going to be conservative. The next thing is, depending on what type of vehicle it is, it may be one that's desirable or not so desirable. So I'm going to tell a couple of stories here, and really both of them could fall under the category of not so desirable um, from, a, from a dealer's perspective. But, um, but I just want to lay that out there. There are some cars that are in high demand. The dealer sees it and goes, oh, I know I could turn this car in two days. There's another car that they're looking at uh, that comes in, and they might say, wow, you know, this thing could be a, you know, really difficult to sell. It could take me two or three weeks, a month. You know, I could even lose money on this thing. So, you know, from their perspective, um, you know, they're, they're taking a fair amount of risk every time that they do a trade-in. Now, having said that, on the other side, you do know your car. You do know how well you've maintained it. And, and, and even if it's a car that would be difficult for a, a dealer to sell, you can, you know, make it attractive enough from a pricing perspective to move it quickly. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail when I tell the story of, of one of my vehicles that I tried to trade in and ultimately sold myself. So let's go ahead and jump into that story. In 2010, uh, my wife and I had three vehicles. We had two Jeep Grand Cherokees and a 1996 Isuzu Trooper. Now, the Trooper I had owned since 1999. I bought it with 69,000 miles. I think I paid about maybe $9,000 for it. I got a really good deal when I bought it. And uh, I had driven it uh, as my primary vehicle until about 2004. And that's when I bought my uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. And at that point, the Trooper became an extra vehicle. It was paid off and we just kept it around. You know, insurance and annual registration and inspection were really the only fees that we had and the costs that we had associated with that vehicle. So we kept it around as a third vehicle. It was very handy. My wife and I have uh, a little bit of rental property and we would use the Trooper to haul things and so forth. And we got to the point where uh, we decided that um, I wanted to get rid of both the Jeep and the Isuzu Trooper and buy a truck. So we've been out searching for trucks and I came across a 2008 Ford F-150 FX4, which is their, you know, basically their, their 4x4 model. 
And I found it at a dealership and they were asking right at $23,000 for this for this vehicle. Now, when we went out to look at it, I didn't have my trooper with me, didn't intend to do a deal that day. So I told the salesman that I was interested in it, in it and, and, and that I would come back the next day to uh, take a look at it. So I went home, um, got the trooper all ready to trade in, cleaned it up, you know, all the things that uh, that you would want to do before you uh, sell a car. Cleaned it inside and out, made sure there weren't any issues. And I should probably take a moment and say that this trooper was in really good shape. The interior was just almost perfect. And uh, there was one small ding in the back bumper where I had uh, bumped, in, uh, bumped into a pole in a parking lot, you know, many, many years earlier. But, um, but for the age and mileage, it was in really good shape. It had 149,000 miles at the time that I was ready, getting ready to sell it. Now, if I put myself in the dealer's shoes for just a moment with this vehicle, I'll look at it and say, this is not a vehicle I maybe wanted on my lot. In fact, um, given the, uh, the dealership that I was working at, they probably would have never even put this car on their lot. All they would have done is wholesaled it off to somebody else. So that's something to keep in mind here when you think about um, what had to happen in this process. They had to get this car cheap enough that they could wholesale it to somebody else who could then ultimately sell it. And so there was another you know, person in this transaction that's not seen, and, uh, and they had to keep that person in mind when they were giving me a price. So before I took the trooper in, I went and did my homework. And I saw that the trooper, uh, in the condition that it was in, should have been worth about $1,500. And, and my mindset was is that this car is worth so very little, I can't really lose much by, uh, by just trading it in. Thought about that, and I thought, okay, the car is worth $1,500. They're probably going to give me twelve, dollars And if they do that, you know, I'll take the deal and I'll buy the truck and, uh, and we'll, we'll all be happy about it. So I took the car in and prob- they, they looked at it for probably 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. And they came back and they offered me $600. Now, I want to remind you, I was about to pay cash for a $23,000 truck and they came back and offered me $600 for my trade. I told the salesman that uh, that, that wasn't enough, that $600 was not going to get the deal done. And so he asked me, well, what do you have to have to do the deal? And I said, well, I've done some research and it looks to me that the car's worth $1,500. So he does the salesman thing and says, okay, so if I can get our sales manager to agree to a $1,500 trade-in price, you will buy the $23,000 truck. I said, absolutely right. So it just so happens the sales manager was walking by the office. So rather than going to the sales manager's office, the salesman just called the sales manager into his office and said, hey, this gentleman will do this deal if you can give him $1,500 for this trooper. And the sales manager, and I'll never forget the, the kind of the abruptness of the uh, statement. And the sales manager said the following, at that price, I don't want the deal. And I was kind of stunned, uh, not that he refused the offer, although I was a little surprised, but uh, but that he didn't... Uh, soften that that just that just a little bit to uh, to get the deal done. Now to be fair, I don't know what they had invested in the uh, truck that I was looking at even though it was a $23,000 truck, you know, maybe they didn't have that much margin in that truck. Maybe it it sat on their lot for quite a while and and they didn't have that much in it, right? So, I want to be fair to both sides here, but just from my perspective, that abrupt statement uh, made me feel very similarly that uh, at that price, I didn't want the deal either. And so the sales manager and I agreed that we didn't want the deal. And I took my trooper and went home. Now, at this point, I had already cleaned the trooper up for sale. So I didn't have to do anything more than buy two for sale signs, put one in the front, one in the back, park it at the curb of my house. I never even got around to putting, uh, putting the car into Craigslist or Auto Trader because it sold within two days. And uh, and it sold for twenty eight hundred dollars. Now, according to Kelly Blue Book and and what I could find in my area, I might have been able to get thirty two hundred dollars for it. But to do that, I would have had to to uh, you know probably have it on, uh, at my curb much longer, and and would have had to deal with it much more. So I chose to price it at at what I thought was a good aggressive price to get the trooper sold, and it was still much more than the fifteen hundred dollars or the six hundred dollars that uh, that I might have made uh, by trading it in. The other thing I guess I should add there is that the person who bought the trooper um, didn't even ask me to come off the sales price. So I think, you know, I, I had put a pretty good deal on the table. And and so this was a much better deal for me. I also wound up buying a much less expensive truck that I'm, uh, you know, as much or, or more happy with than the one that I would have bought there. So everything worked out for me, you know, all the way around. 
And, uh, and I'm sure it worked out fine for the dealership. I'm sure they, they sold that uh, truck to somebody else. They probably even got to finance it and were probably much happier with the total transaction. But for me, that worked out really well. And so that's my most recent trade-in story. And, and I, um, you know, I share that, again, not to say that that's a typical situation, but every time I've ever tried to trade a car in, it's worked out almost exactly like that, where I've been able to make just much, much more money by, uh, by going and selling the car myself. Now, the next story I want to tell is one that happened uh, as I'm recording this weekend before last. And I was at home. My wife had taken my daughter and they had gone over to a friend's house so that uh, their, the daughters could play together. Uh, they, they have a young child as well. And I get a call from the friend saying, hey, um, we're getting ready to buy another vehicle. And Jennifer says you might be interested in buying ours. Now, the vehicle that we're talking about here is a 2003 Honda Accord EX fully loaded with every option that that car came with except navigation. And I should add that this friend of mine is meticulous about taking care of this vehicle. They do everything. Uh, they wax it every six months. They condition the leather on it often. They have a book where they keep track of every bit of work that's ever been done to that car, as well as all the receipts. And they've also always had it uh, taken care of at the dealership. Now, the reason they were getting ready to trade this vehicle in is twofold. One is the husband now has a commute of about 500 miles a week. And so they want to have something that's, you know, very reliable for them. The other side of it is the power steering pump had gone out in it and the oil pan had uh, started to leak. So for them to get this fixed at the dealership, the dealership had given them an estimate of $1,600. And they just felt like for the value of the car, it probably wasn't worth investing another $1,600 in it. So once I got the call, I started doing some research and some quick math to try and figure out if this made sense for me to buy. And what I came up with is that if they're trading it in, given that it needs some repairs and everything, it should trade in for about $2,750. Now, when I went out to Auto Trader and looked at uh, you know 2003 Honda Accords that were for sale in my area, I found that uh, the, the least expensive uh, vehicle I could find was about $6,500. And that's a car with similar miles. Uh, this car had 137,000 miles on it. And so, uh, you know, something in that price range, um, you know, $6,500 was kind of the floor. So I felt pretty good about it. I'm thinking, okay, um, that's not that bad. And, uh, and doing the repairs, maybe not at a dealership, but at uh, my local mechanic, I could probably knock about another $600 off of that price. And, uh, and maybe there's something that I could do here. So, um, so I waited for a return phone call uh, from uh, the husband who was uh, taking the car to get it priced for trade. So he called me back a little bit later, and they had been offered a trade-in price of $2,250. So I said, well, yeah, uh, we will definitely uh, buy the car for $2,250. I'm more than happy to do that. And, and, and I, you know, I hadn't seen the car uh, or, or ridden in it in a few years. So I asked a few questions about the interior condition and so forth. And they confirmed what I thought, that really everything about the car was immaculate. There was one little ding in the back bumper, um, but everything else about the car was really perfect. The tires, you know, again, they had the book with all the repairs they had done. So I was feeling really good about, you know, helping them out because, A, I was going to pay them more than the dealer had, had uh, offered because I knew that, you know, a trade-in is a much simpler transaction than, than buying from somebody else uh, or, or, excuse me, selling to somebody else. So I had agreed to pay them more than what the dealer was going to pay. So I had offered to pay them $2,500 for their trouble. And, and my wife was over there with them. And again, I was here trying to, to do some work for my podcast and, and blog. And, and she was talking to them about the fact that, you know, she thought they could do, uh, you know, maybe a better job if they took it to a local mechanic, somebody that they could find recommended by a friend that they could trust. So they decided that they would, they would take this tack. They would, you know, at least put off the idea of, of buying another car right now and take this one in, have somebody look at it, see what the, the price quote would be to do the repairs and so forth. And at this point, they decided to go back and look through their, their repair book and see what kind of repairs had been done to the vehicle. And what they found is that the previous year they had spent about $750 in car repairs, and the previous year less than that. And so this car that they thought was uh, 
you know, certainly going to cost them a lot right now, but they, they had the mindset that they thought it was, it had been costing them, um, you know, quite a bit for a while. And when they really went back and looked at the numbers, they found that, uh, that that was not so much the case. And again, they were able to do that because they kept really good records. And so again, I, I encourage you out, if you, you know, if you're out there and you have a vehicle, you know, get a book, write these repairs down, get a file folder, keep the receipts in one place. It's a really simple way to drive up the value of your car when you're selling it to somebody else. And it can help you make really uh, good decisions about what you should or shouldn't do. So I spoke to this, uh, this family yesterday, and I got an update. They took the car in for the repair, and this didn't go perfect. Uh, th- this, is, this is a bit of a funny story. So they took the car in to get it repaired. The, the, uh, the mechanic that did the repair uses genuine Honda parts. So, uh, you know, they could have probably gotten it done cheaper if they had gotten a used part. But by doing it this way, they wanted to ensure themselves they had a good quality part in the car and it was something that would last. Well, as fate would have it, they got one of the bad Honda, genuine Honda parts. And so the car had to be repaired twice for the, uh, for the, tr- for the uh, power steering. On top of that, when, the, uh, uh, when they were doing the repair, they found another leak uh, between the engine and the transmission. And, and this cost them another $800. So they wound up spending eighteen hundred dollars uh, to get all the leaks repaired, and the little ding in the back bumper, the uh, the mechanic shop was able to fix that and uh, and set that up so that uh, that looked much better. And so um, there was one other issue with with the car; they had replaced a headlight uh, some years previously, so one was a little foggy and one was clear. Well, they had that repaired as well, all for eighteen hundred dollars. And so now they feel a much much better about the car. And on top of that, uh, my friend asked the mechanic, look, uh, you know, I feel like I'm taking a chance here. This car is pretty old. It's got 137,000 miles. You know, uh, I'm I'm wondering if I should sell it. Am I going to have another major repair sometime soon? And the mechanic said, look, if you're selling this car, I will buy it. This car is in great condition and everything that's major on it looks to be in good shape. And so, you know, it just validated what my friend had already started to believe based on, you know, the interest my wife and I had in the car. And again, my wife and I are looking at this and we're saying, you know, we can probably have a car that's worth at least $6,500 for about $3,500. That's what we were thinking at the time. You know, it was really kind of funny because, you know, it's one thing when you trade a car in and the dealership's going to give you twenty two fifty for it. You kind of look at it and say, okay, that's just what my car is worth. But when a friend offers you $2,500 for that same car, it starts to feel like maybe I wasn't getting such a good deal at all. And, and I think that was some of what came into play here. And, um, and I'm really happy for my friends that they decided to keep their car. I, I knew it was a fantastic car. I mean, uh, this, uh, this family has owned this car since it was new. They know everything about it. They've maintained it meticulously. And, and the dealership couldn't know that, right? They don't know uh, how meticulously this car has been maintained. And that's the challenge for the dealership, which is why they can't afford to give you top dollar uh, for your trade-in. They don't know where it's been, you know, because you could clean your car up and make it look great, and it could have uh, not had an oil change in quite a while. And yeah, the dealership could, you know, check the oil and see that it's a little black or whatever. But the fact is, is that there are, there are still risks associated with this. Now, in this case, um, you know, my friend had a really great car, and um, I think they made a great decision. I think they're going to be very happy with this decision and that uh, they're going to get a lot more uh, miles and years out of this particular vehicle. And when and if they get ready to trade it in, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably still be willing to buy it. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out over the long haul. But, um, you know, even this car, a 2003 Honda Accord, um, really wouldn't be desirable for a lot of dealerships. It's just too old. Um, uh, you know, the, the dealerships where you're buying new cars, um, they tend not to want a car that old on their lot and something that sells for that little. I guess the, the, the kind of the final piece to this story is I also went out and did a search on Auto Trader for 2003 Honda Accords that uh, were upgraded uh, like the one my friend had. And it was really interesting. I told you that private, private sellers were selling this car for $6,500 as the floor. Well, the floor for um, for this model of car at a dealership was seventy two hundred dollars, and the most expensive one that I could find for sale at a at a new car dealership was nine thousand dollars. So, what I'm saying here is that um, you know somebody was going to make a lot of money on this thing, probably the wholesaler more than likely in in their case. But um, 
you know, and, and I'm not saying that this was necessarily going to be a bad deal for them. Uh, you have to look at your own circumstances and determine what is it, what is my time worth, right? Let's, let's jump in sort of out of my friend's story now into, um, you know, if I'm looking at selling my own car or trading it in, what are some of the things I should think about? I think the very first thing is you need to make sure you know what your vehicle is worth, what it's worth to you, what's what's your bottom line price, and, and be really firm with that. So that's the first thing, right? I mean, if they, you know, you're in the dealership, you're looking at that new car or in another car, um, don't go in and not know what your bottom line price is. Make sure you know that going in, and then you can make a clean decision, not have to worry about uh, whether you're you're making a bad decision in the heat of the moment. Go in forearmed with all the information you can about your vehicle to uh, to make you to help you make a better decision. The other thing I would say is that you know selling your own car isn't for everybody. Uh, you have to you know you have to know what the value of your car is. You have to know um, how easily cars sell in your area. You know, uh, when I've sold uh, the last three vehicles I sold myself, I sold two of them within one day. And that means within a 24 hour period of the time I put them in my curb. And the trooper took uh, less than 48 hours. Now, to be fair, I lived on a fairly busy street. So I got a lot of traffic. A lot of people were seeing the vehicles. And all the vehicles I sold, sold for under $5,000. So none of the vehicles I sold, um, we're, we're requiring people to go get loans and all those kinds of things. This was a very sweet price point for a lot of folks. And since all these vehicles were very clean and well-maintained, it was kind of a no-brainer for people to buy them. So uh, uh, so you have to look at that yourself. You have to look at your vehicle. How clean is it? How well have you maintained it? How, how much traffic comes by where you live? Or, or can you put it in a place where it will be seen uh, to get you some traffic and get you some notice? Um, and you have to think about what your time is worth, you know? Um, if you're selling a $2,000 car and the, the dealership's offering you $500, okay, that's $1,500 Delta. What is your time worth and, and, and how much time would it take you to sell that car? One of the things I should say here is that I'm going to link in the show notes several articles about trading in cars and selling your own car, things to think about. So if you're kind of on the fence about that, I, I'm going to have those linked up and you can take a look at those and see how best they might work for you and, and whether you're making the right decision for yourself by either trading in or selling yourself. I've told you two really great stories about uh, how you know dealerships were really kind of lowballing uh, on some things. And I'm going to tell you kind of a counter story here. I have a friend who uh, had a, a Toyota Highlander, and I don't know the exact year model, but... Uh, they went to trade this vehicle in and they were offered $16,000. Now, this friend did some research online and found that uh, this car should have been worth about seven, or excuse me, $22,000. So they uh, put an ad in Craigslist. I, I believe they also put an ad on Auto Trader and, and listed this vehicle for sale. And they were just getting no hits, no hits whatsoever. And this vehicle had been well maintained. Now, they had probably owned it for, let's say, four years, maybe. And, um, and so they hadn't bought it new, right? They didn't have that level of detail of paperwork, but they had meticulously maintained this car. They they did have paperwork for all the time they had owned it, and and they had kept it clean. It hadn't been in any accidents. So it was a really nice car. It was the um, kind of the bare bones model of that particular uh, uh, car, but um, but they just couldn't get the nibbles that they wanted. So ultimately, they wound up selling it for a little over $17,000. And and they didn't really feel like, even though they got more than the dealership was offering them, they didn't feel like they really got a good trade-off of their, uh, you know, when, when they looked at how much time it had taken them to sell that vehicle and how, how many, uh, you know, how much of a hassle it was for them. It's not always going to be the best decision for you uh, necessarily to sell for yourself, but but that's something you need to think about. And again, be aware of what your, uh, you know, what your own limits are. And the reason I wanted to tell this trade in, uh, these trade-in stories today is that I'm hoping some of you out there will realize maybe you can't go to a cash car right now. Maybe that's not the thing that you can do. But if you can downsize your vehicle, you will help yourself be positioned to get out of debt much quicker. It's much easier to pay off a $15,000 car than it is a $30,000 car. And it's easier to pay off a $10,000 car than a $15,000 car. So I'm hopeful that, that some of you listening out there will decide to sell your own vehicle, get the most you can out of it, and then take, assuming you're not upside down uh, or underwater in your car loan, take that money and uh, look to uh, you know downsize your vehicle and get yourself into something that's closer to something that you can afford.
That's going to wrap up this episode. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Kinson. I am the Cash Car Convert. Let me help you buy a cash car and kick auto debt to the curb. Welcome back. If you would uh, like some more information about this episode, or if you would like to get some of the links to other websites that will help you uh, understand the trade-in process, as well as uh, some some uh, links that will help you sell your car, please go to cashcarconvert.com slash 012. Again, that's cashcarconvert.com slash 012, and you'll find the show notes there. If you're enjoying the Cash Car Convert podcast and you're finding the information that's being provided here useful, please consider going out to iTunes and subscribing and then following that up with a rating and review. Those are things that iTunes uh, iTunes looks at very carefully when they're determining what shows to promote and uh, which ones to uh, you know give some, t- some top ratings to. So I'd very much appreciate that. I'd like some honest feedback uh, to, to help me make this show a better show. I want to make it uh, something that uh, is valuable to you, the listener. And along those same lines, if you have a, a thought or idea for a future episode, something that you're interested in, something that you're struggling with around the car buying experience or selling experience, please reach out to me. Uh, you can get me on Twitter at Cash Car Convert. Again, that's at Cash Car Convert on Twitter. Or you can leave me an email at Cash Car Convert at gmail.com. Again, that's cashcarconvert at gmail.com. And just drop me a line, let me know what you're interested in, and I'll uh, be happy to do a future episode to try and help you and all the others who probably have a very similar question. With that, thank you so much for listening. Remember, invest in yourself, not things. Daddy, I love you.